Awesome. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Sean. Hi, guys. Um, so, yeah, the title of this presentation is The Lion is the Lamb, Revisiting Revelation's Holy Wars. Um, this is a topic that I found very interesting, and uh, I think it will be important for us, especially as time continues to go. Uh, my last presentation, I talked about the suffering of the innocent, how that is Christ and Him crucified. And today we're going to dig a little bit more into that, but how it relates to us as Christians as well, not only for what we can do for others, but how this truth can encourage us when times will get rough down the path. So with that being said, let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll get into it. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, and it's such a blessing to be with like-minded believers, Lord, who love you and your character so much. We thank you for all of the beautiful truths and light you've given us, Father. We, we desire to grow more and more in truth each and every day, and more than that, we want to be sanctified by these truths, Father. So we ask that we won't only have an intellectual understanding of these things, but that the truth will change our characters and form us into the image of your own dear Son. So God, I ask that as I pre present this message, that the thoughts that I convey will not be my own, but that they'll be uh, yours through me, Father. I pray that you'll help everyone understand and that you'll give me the words to speak. Thank you for hearing us and for answering our prayer. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay. So, how many of you are familiar with the mirror principle? Okay. God's law is a mirror of, um, well, it's like a mirror of our condition. Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, you bring up God's law. The actual Greek of God's law, it, or the Hebrew, excuse me, can be interpreted either as an imperative command or as a promise, which is really interesting. So, even there, it's a mirror. How do you read? Is this God telling you, here's a list of 10 things you have to do? Or are these 10 promises of God saying, you won't kill, you won't steal, because I'm living in you and through you. Right? Um, and so I'm going to show a little object lesson of the mirror principle real quick. So I'm going to show you all a picture. And I want you to just say the first thing you see. Okay? Don't need to wait. Just go. Well, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and the next images, okay? All right. So I'm going to put the picture up, and then you're just going to say it. All right? All right. Do, do we all understand the assignment? Okay, here we go. Horse donkey. donkey. Horse donkey. Anything else? A seal. Right? Do you guys? What is Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, some of you can. Yeah. So this is really interesting. We have, you know, depending on, depending on how you read, how you see, uh, we have some donkey ears with the donkey eyes with a little snout, or this can be a seal's face with little fins, there and there. Uh, really interesting. Okay. Here's another one. This one's a classic. What do we see? See a duck. Does Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, right right here we have a duck, the duck eye with the bill facing over here or a rabbit with the the rabbit eye with instead of a bill this would be the ears backwards. You all see that? Yes. Okay, here's another. Yeah. 
The horse. All right, raise your hand if you can see both. Can you can you all see the frog and the horse? Dan, can you see both? Yeah. Yeah, it's a weird horse thing. But yeah, so all right. Now here's this is a really good one. This next one. What do you see? All right. Do you all see both? Do you see it, Abraham? Where's the young lady? It's the chin, the jawline. Look at the old lady's nose. That's the lady is facing to the right. That's her jawline. And her mouth is next. Shamaya, you don't see anything? Oh no. Yeah, okay. Okay. So raise your hand if you don't see both images. It's okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So you only see the young lady. Can you come point it out to Abraham? Just what this looks like. All right. So this is her lower jaw, and this is her nose, and she's looking away. Her ear and a necklace. And this is like a feather off her hat, like the peacock feathers they used to wear. And then the white thing's like this a... Is like this is the hard one. This is the hard one. She's looking like this. This is the jawline. So, so look at me, like, look at me. Here, watch this, here. Look, look at, look at right here. Look at that. That's the... That's her view. It's it takes us okay, okay. So this oh you so you don't see the old lady here Abraham come come show Sean the old lady. I see it. That's all I see is the old lady, bro. I see an old lady. You know, for a second I thought that was like a crow. <laughs> I yeah. see your eyes now. Yeah. Sean, can you see the old lady now? All I see is the, the eyes. The young, the young lady looks very much more like normal dimension. The young, the old lady's like really distorted. Yeah, distorted. Yeah. yeah. Kind of very crooked. Yeah. 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 Yeah, you see that? Yeah, it's kind of weird, huh? Do you see the young lady, Jonah? Yeah, of Okay, you see them both, cool. Okay. So this is the predicament we're in as a ministry, right? We see things one way, people see things another way, and we're both trying to show each other the true picture, right? Um, it's really interesting. Um, Were you trying to bring up Rorschach? I, I was just about to mention, yeah, so psychologists have this test called Rorschach tests, which is otherwise known as ink blot tests. They'll basically get paper with ink blot, put ink blots on it in a certain pattern or way, and they'll show it to a patient, and whatever, they just say the first things that come to mind that they see. It's really it's very ambiguous. And what these images I've showed you, they're called ambiguous images. If you want to have a fun time on the internet, look up ambiguous images. Uh, you can find a lot of these, very fun. Um, but yes, Rorschach test, psychologists will use these and people will look at it and some people will see like birds or someone will see like demons or it just depends. And really it's all just a projection of what's in their mind already. Uh, it can be anything. So basically, yeah, that's how the Bible is a lot of times. Not that it can be just anything we want it to be, but that there's two ways of seeing it, an old covenant and a new covenant experience. Um, so a lot more could be said about that, but this are, is... Are those ambiguous images designed to have basically something you would see, either something that would be good or pure or happy and then hmm. the, the opposite the inverse would be sad or dark or depressing you mean like the rorschach tests yeah which are ambiguous images. true uh, 
Yeah, it's oh, okay. yeah, it's just random. And so there is a, a fascinating, ambiguous image as I image I've seen, which uh, what it is, it's it's like a vase, and it has this one is very interesting. It's inappropriate for children. It has uh, adults. When we look at it, we see two people uh, in an intimate relationship, right? It's it's not detailed. It's just that. But when children see it. All they can see are dolphins. The children can only see dolphins uh, because they've never been exposed. Their minds haven't been corrupted. Uh, they can't, they've, they've done studies. They just can't even find the people at all. And the people, us adults who've been, had our minds so perverted, we can only see the people. We can't find the dolphins. Um, that's how the Bible is a lot of times. Um, and so with that introduction, uh, and another fun thing is ambiguous uh, sounds. Have you guys heard like the Laurel or Yanny thing before? Right? There's certain sounds which uh, have both high and low frequencies together. Certain ears pick up certain sounds. It's a whole thing. Very fascinating. But with this in mind, I'm going to, we're going to look a little bit at Revelation, the book of Revelation tonight, which... A lot of us in our ministry, we think God is nonviolent. Uh, but when we talk to people about this idea, what do they usually bring up? What, what are their arguments in Scripture from usually? Old Testament where God well, says, go, go kill the people and then you'll, inher you'll inherit the land and I'll go with you and you'll be victorious in battle. Exactly, exactly. But how about the New Testament? Oh, you, Ananias, yep. Second coming of Christ. Yep. Yeah, and one of the most common is exactly one of the biggest ones is the book of Revelation, and it is a huge mirror. It is one of the biggest mirrors that exists, and we aren't going to look at all every detail of it, but I want to bring out a few things that we haven't talked about as much. But does anyone recognize uh, this? Raise your hand if you know what these books are. Does anyone know? Yeah, this is like that. Um, that series of like the rapture and stuff like that. Yeah. Oh, left behind. Yeah. I I've seen that Tim LaHaye. The name. Mm. Name. Yeah. If you go to a used bookstore or something, especially in the Bible Belt, you'll find tons of these there. They're everywhere. And if you're raised traditional evangelical, uh, this is like almost canon. Um, if you just talk to any evangelical, Protestant evangelical on the street, ma the majority of what they understand from prophecy is from uh, these first few books here. Because wow. they've made movies about them. And, yeah, yeah. Right? Left Behind, you know, they did a revamp with Nicolas Cage. Uh, it's terrible. It's wow. terrible. But I grew up with this stuff. Uh, this is the stuff I learned. And so it's very interesting in doing research for this presentation, seeing how it describes things like the second coming and it'll give us really an eye-opener for how the world sees these final events so in the last book the glorious reappearing uh, it's written tens of thousands fell dead this is supposed to be the second coming right simply dropping where they stood their bodies ripped open blood pooling in great masses tens of thousands grabbed their heads or their chests <coughs> fell to their knees and writhed writhed as they were invisibly sliced asunder their inwards and entrails gushed to the desert floor, their blood pooling and rising in the unforgiving brightness of the glory of Christ. Their flesh dissolved, their eyes melted, and their tongues disintegrated. Is this almost like, like they're almost like speaking in prophetic authority? Uh, in, their, in their perspective and to the people? Uh, not necessarily. This is just a fictionalized okay. telling of how they see these end events. Pretty much. So this is how the majority of the world teach these final events. Uh, and it's, I, I hate it. I think it's terrible. Um, and, but is any wonder why non-believers don't like Christianity? Right. And so it's, it's interesting how non-believers throughout history have looked at the book of Revelation as well. So Nietzsche, right, he called Revelation that most obs obscene of all the written outbursts, 
which has revenge on its conscience. That's how he saw it, right? God has revenge on his conscience. Uh, Carl Jung, the psychologist, he called it a veritable orgy of hatred, wrath, vindictiveness, and blind destructive fury that revels in fantastic images of terror that breaks out and with blood and fire overwhelms a world which Christ had just endeavored to restore to the original state of innocence and loving communion with God. Interesting. But at the same time, not only non-believers had this view of Revelation, but also even Christians, right? Protestant reformers, Martin Luther. He said, I miss more than one thing in this book, and it makes me consider it to be neither apostolic nor prophetic. For me, this is reason enough not to think highly of it. Christ is neither taught nor known in it. The book of Revelation. Yes. Uh, Luther, even Zwingli, 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 and Calvin, they also rejected Revelation as canonical. Um, but do you blame them for some of these things, seeing the scriptures in this way? Uh, they didn't have some of the understanding and truth that God has revealed to us. We wouldn't either if we were left to our own private interpretation. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so we, we shouldn't judge or condemn them because that's, yeah. Yeah, but we wouldn't put down an entire book of the Bible just because we couldn't understand it. Mm. When yeah. I, when I first asked Christ in my heart, I read the Bible cover to cover for two years, mm. and there's only one book in the Bible I didn't understand at all. Mm. I, didn't, I didn't assume it because it was a promised book. Mm. It's, it's possible, too, like Luther, when in his life did he say this at the end, middle? Yeah, I it's, think, I don't know. His, his views could have changed. It was 1982, too. Well, no, that was just, yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> right. Um, but so why do a lot of people see Revelation as super violent? It looks like it's violent, right? Yes, and so as we're going to see, we're going to look at, I'm just going to touch the surface. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So the way we interpret Revelation, it can oftentimes tell us not a lot, not only a lot about God, but a lot about ourselves, right? And so what we're going to see in this presentation is that John, he'll take Old Testament imagery, violent Old Testament imagery, and he'll flip it on its head in a really cool and unique way, uh, which is what our ministry is all about. Uh, allowing the life of Christ to reinterpret Old Testament imagery. So, specifically, we're going to look at the topic of holy war. Holy war in Revelation. Uh, this is all throughout Revelation and all of these passages. You have the idea of war, uh, all sorts of stuff. And the question we need to ask first is, how does Satan make war? In the book of Revelation, we read, and when they, the two witnesses, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and what? Kill them. Exactly. Here we see. And in her, Babylon, was found all the blood of, was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. The word slain means literally slaughter or to kill by violence. This is Satan's method that he used uh, all throughout history. You look from Babylon to you know, Persia, Greece, Rome, the papacy, all this violence. Well, actually, yeah, what happened when the violence stopped working? Compromise. Deception. Compromise. Deception, right? The other methods used by Satan is deception and misrepresentation. And we get a very powerful illustration of this in... Revelation 13 with the first beast, right, which we understand to be the papacy. We have literature in there going into all of this if this idea is unfamiliar to some of you, right? But so this first beast is described as a beast. Christ is likewise described as a beast, as a lamb. Uh, the papacy is described as coming up out of the water. Christ at his baptism, he came up out of the water. 
uh, the beast looked like the one before him, which was the dragon. Both have seven heads, right? Uh, Christ looks like the one that came before him, his father. Both of them have horns. Both of them have crowns. And both of them have the na- a name written on them. One, the name of blasphemy, and another, the name of his father. Amen. Right? Also, one is described as looking like a leopard bear and a lion. And in Hosea, Christ is also described as looking like a leopard bear and a lion. Both had power thrown in authority. Both were wounded to death. Both had their deadly wound healed. All the world wondered after them. And they both continued for three and a half years. Right? Uh, credit to Daniel Mesa for this insight. Yeah, it's really cool. But, so here we see the idea of misrepresentation and deception. This is what the papacy does. Right? It, this is how it blasphemes God or slanders God. His, his name, his character to the world. It says, God is like us. God makes laws and decrees and he kills people who reject us and we burn them alive, right? That's that's what God is like. So deception and violence and force, that's in Satan's arsenal. But what about Jesus? Well, uh, according to some people on the religious right today, this this is what it looks like. They say, Jesus is an ultimate fighter, warrior king, with a tattoo down his leg who rides into battle against Satan, sin, and death on a trusty horse, just like every decent Western from all these guys. Right? They, they see Jesus as John Wayne, right? Cowboy. Exactly. People use that to justify tattoos and all of these things. Uh, they say Jesus is like John Wayne in the Wild West and has to execute justice on these criminals. And got a gun on his hip. He's ready to take him down. Yeah, right. They continue. If we were to see Jesus today, we would see him in glory, not in humility. We would see a Jesus who will never take a beating again, but is coming again to open a can on the unrepentant until their blood flows upon the earth like grapes, crushing the violence of a wine press. Did Jesus, does Jesus change? No. Exactly. Patrick. I, it's interesting that they use the word glory there, and our understanding mm. of the word glory in this message is, is the character. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's a complete misre- misrepresentation of the character. The power. Exactly. Exactly. So this is, you know, Christian nationalism. This is, this is how they view Jesus. Jesus is coming to kick butt and take names, right? He's not messing around. We've, we've turned Jesus into our own image. You know, elsewhere these same authors said, I can never worship a guy that I could beat up. Obviously he doesn't realize he is beating him up. Right, and so the main passage a lot of people look at for this view of Jesus is Revelation 19, where John saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. See the mirror there? How do you read? And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon the white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. This is a mirror, huge mirror. There's so much we can unpack in this, but I don't have time. Uh, So I do go into pretty much each aspect of this and the book I'm working on, Forbidden Fruit. A lot of it will be especially in footnotes when referencing these things, but I want to look at the robe dipped in blood. The robe dipped in blood. This is a huge mirror because just like those pictures earlier, you know, when we see this mental image, what do we see? Whose blood is it? The blood of his enemies. The blood of the Lamb. Yeah, which is it? The blood of his enemies that he slayed and just 
crushed? No. It's his blood. Exactly. Yes. Mm. Oh, I love that. That's a great connection. How Ellen White says that in heaven, those who are martyred will have, what is it, a little fringe or tassel? Yeah, a, red, a, red border, right? a red border. A red border. Yeah. Showing that they had been martyrs. Uh, so, yes, we see that those, these, the ten horns, make war with the lamb. And the lamb, which previously is the slain lamb, shall overcome them. So the one that overcome, overcomes them is the slain lamb. Right? For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Christ's robes are dipped in his own blood because he's the lamb. And he is covered with the blood even before the war begins. Sharina. Mm. From the mouth of babes. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Joseph's coat of many colors. Oh. Yeah. 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 yeah, Shemaya brought out, for those that couldn't hear, how the parallel with Joseph, who his brothers persecuted him and took his robe and dipped it in blood. Interesting. To deceive. To deceive, yes. Wow. Mm. That's a deep thought. I, yeah, we could go study that for a while. And so, how does Christ win the war? Is it by violence? How did, what is the key to winning the war? Yeah, but how did Christ win the war for us? He laid down his life. He died, right? Because the cross exposes Satan as a liar he is, and it reveals God for the lover he is. Mm. And he actually was nailed to a cross. Really? And he pulls the nails out of the cross and takes himself down. And I, and at that, I walked out of the theater because I'm mm. like, this is blasphemous. Mm. Because Jesus couldn't save us. He couldn't save himself and save us. Yeah. He saves the world by pulling himself off of a cross. Mm. Wow. Just, wow. Just the blasphemy that Satan is pushing through Hollywood. And that's just the blatant things that we can see clearly. Imagine how much subliminal things have filled our minds with that. And so Christ doesn't win the war with violence, but by being the victim of violence. That's how the war is won, through the cross of Christ. So what about the sword from his mouth? Should be pretty simple, right? What is, is this literal, the sword from his mouth? Exactly. We know that Christ said, He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. He also told his disciples, Put up the, thy sword into its place, for all that, that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Does he break his own rules? Does, double standards? No. Uh, and like Brother Abraham said, Scripture says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Isn't that what we see? Like with the ambiguous images, it reveals our mind, like Rorschach tests. That's what scripture is like. We read it and how we interpret it, it the word of God is literally discerning the thoughts and intentions of our hearts. Right? If we interpret Christ with his vesture dipped in blood, what does that say about our character? We have violence in us. Exactly. Christ's testimony is his sword, right? The sword is his testimony. That's why it comes out of his mouth. It's what he revealed about God. The sword of the Spirit, exactly. And that's the sword he uses to beat the lies of the devil, right? And Satan has his own sword, which comes out of his mouth. All in Revelation, you see mouth symbolism. In Revelation 9.19, we see that the power of fallen angels is in their mouth. The serpent tries to destroy the church by what comes from his mouth. The water's spewing forth. 
The beast from the sea has a mouth which speaks slanders against God. Slanders is misrepresentation, really. And unclean spirits come from the mouths of the dragon, beast, and false prophet to deceive the world. So again, Satan uses deception and violence to wage war. Christ wages war by presenting truth and by being the victim of violence. So that begs the question, well, what about Christ's armies? How, how did they make war? How, do we, how should we wage war? They love not their life, they run to death. Exactly. All right, let's end it there. We could end it there, right? That's it. They, they love not their life unto the death. Right? And so, but first I want to look at the context of Revelation. Who this book was written to, the culture, and some of the ideas that these people had. And so, in Revelation 1.3, it says, blessed is he that readeth and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. When John wrote the book of Revelation, he sent it to the seven churches. And the way this would have worked is that everyone would come and gather together and the shepherd of the congregation would read, stand up and read the book of Revelation all the way through the congregation. It was to be heard orally. Right? And so the thing about it is, is that John uses lots of Old Testament symbolism in Revelation. So when his audience hears certain key words or phrases or mental pictures, they have a certain idea that comes to mind. Right? Uh, and we'll see that in a minute. So one of the big ways that this is done is that, you know, the pastor of the church will be speaking and They'll say something, and then, like I said, the audience will hear that, right? And they'll have a certain understanding, a preconceived idea. And then the John describes seeing something, which changes their perception of the preconceived idea. Okay? I'll give you uh, my favorite example. In the throne room scene, we see, One of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Right, so what does John hear the angel say? The lion. the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Right, so he says, the angel is saying, just imagine with me, right? You're John and I'm the angel and I'm saying, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Then he sees a lamb. Right? He's saying, behold, the line of the tribe of Judah. <laughs> <laughs> Me and my wife recently for our anniversary, we went to an animal encounter where we got to hold like a three-day-old baby lamb and feed it. And it was awesome. And and many other animals given that as well. Very many. And this is a little video of me uh, petting a little lamb. Right, right. so this is our Savior, right? Um, John heard the lion, but he saw the lamb. That's the thing, the lion is the lamb. And what's really interesting is that the connotation that the phrase, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, what that meant to people in the early church, right? What did they think when they heard this? This is really fascinating. So Richard Bauckham, a Bible scholar, he says, He hears that the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. The two messianic titles evoke a strongly militaristic and nationalistic image of the Messiah of David as conqueror of the nations, destroying the enemies of God's people. That was in the mind of Israel, right? The line of the tribe of du Judah is going to come in. Kill everyone. And kill those Romans. Kill the Romans. Exactly. <laughs> kill the Romans. You know, I found it interesting. He pointed out it was militaristic and nationalistic. Mm -hmm. Does that remind you of anything going on in America today? Yeah. yeah. I saw this online the other day. Recently. Yeah. yeah. We, how, how many of you have seen uh, Jesus with an American flag with a little lamb next to him? Oh, no. uh, usually it's a lion. Right? Because the lion is fierce and it's the king of the jungle, right? 
Uh, that's the idea that we get. Bauckham continues, but this image, the line of the tribe of Judah, is reinterpreted by what John sees, the lamb whose sacrificial death has redeemed people from all nations. Right? So the early church or the early Jew, Jewish believers, they would have thought the, of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. Right? This is just for us. Right? Just for us. But then, then John sees, no, this is for all people. All people. By juxtaposing the two contrasting images, John has forged a new symbol of conquest by sacrificial death. I love that. Conquest by sacrificial death. That's how we conquer. The Messiah has certainly won a victory, but he has done so by sacrifice and for the benefit of people from all nations. Sabrina. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, Christ made the animals in Eden, all of them, vegetarians, right? The lion wasn't eating anyone and killing. Great point. And so, heaven's end time army. So we're going to use that principle again of John hearing something, then seeing something. This happens about four times in Revelation that I've seen. Uh, that was the first one. Another one is towards the end where John, the angel says, Behold, the bride of the Lamb. And then he looks and he sees New Jerusalem. Interesting. Another one is where an angel tells John, Behold, the judgment of the great whore, which sits upon many waters. And so he hears that the whore sits on waters. He looks and he sees the whore sitting on a beast with ten horns. Which if you compare the uh, imagery of the drying up of the Euphrates with the ten horns turning on the great whore, it's, it's the same thing. But you don't have time for that now. Read my book later. Uh, and so, Heaven's End Time Army. This is really interesting. Uh, and I heard the number of them that were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So this is really fascinating because at what follows after this is the language of a military census. Right? Like someone's standing up. We have 12,000 from the tribe of Judah, 12,000 from Benjamin. 12,000 from this, right? It's the same language as in Numbers 31, 3, and 4 before uh, I think they were to fight against Midian. And Moses spake unto the people, saying, Arm some of yourselves unto the war, and let them go against the Midianites, and avenge the Lord of Midian. Of every tribe, a thousand. Throughout all the tribes of Israel shall ye send to the war. So this is a callback. This language in Revelation, the 144,000, is a callback so this, but instead of a thousand from each tribe, we have 12,000. Not only that, but the 144,000, they abstain from uh, intimate relations. They're virgins, scripture says, which in Old Testament times, before battle, you would also abstain from those relations. Not only that, but there's also the description of ritual purification after battle. They washed their robes and made them white. 144,000 do. Inciting that they had like blood on them or something. Mm. That yeah, that's the thought. Right? So we see this in Numbers 31 as well. And do ye abide without the camp seven days? Whoever killed anyone, purify all your raiment. So yes, ever after battle, people would have blood all over them and they would stay out of the camp for a time and clean the blood off of their clothes to get them white and clean again. But it's interesting when John's audience, so when John's audience hears the 144,000, they have this idea of the 144,000 being the end time people that are going to conquer with the Messiah and kill all their enemies. That was the thought they had back then. And it's interesting, some people that really oppose our message, they think the same thing today, that uh, the final remnant will hear the voice of God tell them to kill the evil people. People believe that. Yeah, and that's 
That's what happens. And so how does John flip this imagery on its head? Uh, before I go on, I want to say, since we're talking about the 144,000, some people have all sorts of theories. I'm not promoting a theory. Uh, I'm just pointing out an interesting parallel. So do with this as you want. So what did John hear the angels say about this group? How many were there? 144,000. From where? 12 tribes of Israel. Right. Same idea as the Messiah as a military conqueror. That was nationalistic as well. So, but what does he see after this census? And after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man can number, of all nations. So again, just like Christ redeems from all nations, the 144,000 in great multitude are from every nation. Right? It's not a Jewish thing, I don't believe. And they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. Amen. Right? So you could see this as 144,000 being the same as the great multitude or being part of the great multitude. Either way, uh, I personally like the idea that there will be more than 144,000 in the end. I like Hallelujah. that. I might be wrong. I like that one too. <laughs> but that's okay. We don't have to debate about it. It doesn't matter. All we should do is try to strive to be part of God's faithful in the end. Amen. Right? So John had heard the 144,000 Hebrew soldiers. Then he sees a countless, ethnically diverse multitude of people. And so, okay, how does this group really wage war? That's a question. Well, we saw it in the previous verses. It's by worshiping the Lamb, right? If we worship the Lamb, we'll be conformed into the image of the Lamb. If we worship the beast, we'll be conformed into the image of the beast. The Lamb is Christ and His testimony, His perfect life on earth, of what He says about God. He says, this is what God is like. If that's what we worship, we'll become like that. But if we worship the beast and how the beast portrays Christ, right, as this militaristic, nationalistic God, imperial, saying that God is like Caesar. His laws are like the decrees of Caesar and the popes, right? Then we'll become like that. And that's how the image of the beast is formed, which is a whole other topic, right? And it's cool to imagine how the early church would have thought about this too. They'd have thought, because what is going on with the early church during this time? Was everything peachy keen? Exactly. And were there, uh, in Asia, were there hundreds and thousands of people flocking to big, massive mega churches? No. 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 Where were they going to church at? Synagogues. Homes. Synagogues. Synagogues or homes, right? How would they have felt? Would they, and the, did the Roman Empire like them? Were they? No. 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 The Roman Empire was killing them and trying to stamp them out and saying, there's, there's going to be none of you left. So they would have thought, yes, there's, there's like no one. We have like nothing and they're, they're stomping us out. But in reality, Christ is telling them, no, there's way more than you can imagine. There's a great multitude of honest and faithful people, right? And so how did they get their robes white? Verse 14, right? He asked who these are that came out of the, who, who is the great multitude that was wearing the white? And the angel says, these are they which came out of great tribulation, which have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. Don't catch this nuance, what John is doing here, because it's brilliant. Because in the minds of people, you need to wash, the way you wash your clothes and make them white is by washing blood off of them, getting blood off of them. Here John is saying, no, you get your clothes white by, wa by washing them with blood. Right? Which is the life of Christ. Amen. That's what it's all about. So again, in the Old Testament, soldiers made their garments white and purified them by removing blood. We make our garments white and purified by bathing in blood. It's an inverse. And it's a mirror. How do you read? We don't kill our enemies to win the battle. But we win the battle by allowing ourselves to be killed and persecuted like the lamb. 
by partaking in the cross of Christ, like we saw in my, my earlier presentation. This, when the innocent suffer at the hands of the guilty, that is Christ and Him crucified. Okay, so imagine the encouragement the early church got from this. They would have been being killed and thought that they were being torn down. But so they would have been tempted to think, man, my friends are being killed. I don't know if we're going to make it. But Christ tells them, no, you are winning the battle when you die. You aren't losing. And this is going to be important for us to remember if uh, we follow Christ until the very end. Because in the end, Revelation 24 says, there will be those beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. 20 verse 4. Who didn't worship the beast in his image. Many will have to seal their testimony with blood. But we know that there will be a portion who will be translated. I think it's in Desire of Ages, I'm paraphrasing it, but Ellen White says that Christ will string together a series of unending victories that to the world will look like repeated failure. Mm. Interesting. Wow. Can you, can you say that again? Christ will, I'm paraphrasing it, but Christ will string together a series of unending victories that to the world will look like repeated failures. Wow. Wow. So, uh, Tertullian, in his apology, talks about uh, the result of the cross of Christ in his day, in the person of his people. He says, crucify, torture, condemn, grind us all to powder if you can. Your injustice is an illustrious proof of our innocence. And for the proof of this, it is that God permits us to suffer. But do your worst and rack your inventions for tortures for Christians. It is all to no purpose. You do but attract the world. Make it fall the more in love with our religion. The more you mow us down, the thicker we rise. The Christian blood you spill is like the seed you sow. It springs from the earth again and fructifies the more. That's what happens when people see us suffering for the sake of Christ and the gospel, for helping others and loving others. That will pierce their hearts and lead them to repentance. Why are these people willing to, to die for something they believe in? Exactly. Exactly. That's the question. And uh, these are things we, we need to have in our minds for when these, this day comes. That was, uh, that was exactly what Saul of Tarsus before Paul of Tarsus. That was exactly what he was. He, he used to persecute and then he saw Stephen being stoned, right? Exactly. The stoning of Stephen, what was that? That was Christ crucified. Stephen didn't have any good he brought forth from himself. That was Christ in him that was doing the work. And so when Saul had him killed, he was crucifying Christ with all the people around him, right there. And then what did seeing the cross do to him? It changed him. Not immediately, but in his mind, he knew something was off. And then eventually that bore fruit and brought us one of the greatest missionaries the world has ever seen. Exactly. You've done it to one of the least of these. You've done it unto me, Christ says. And so, yes, we overcome Satan by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of our testimony, and we love not our lives unto the death. That is the key. That is how we will be victorious and take the gospel to the world when the end comes. Because Ellen White talks about, you know, in the early reign at Pentecost, how many were converted in a day? Many. A lot of people. But she says that in the latter rain, it will be even more so than the early rain. Amen. Right? Praise God for that prophet. And that will only happen through the cross of Christ. Yeah. Not abstractly, right? But present through us. As he's lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself. Exactly. The church has these mass baptisms where they baptize 3,000 in the day and Prophecy is fulfilled. Yeah. There's a big difference between 3,000 con baptized and 3,000 converted. Whereas Amen. conversion, true conversion is a rare thing. Mm. Amen. Amen. That's right. Conversion and consecration. That's what the cross will lead to. Not the, the theoretical, theological cross, but the practical cross of everyday life. And not only just being killed, but also just being persecuted. Because that's the cross too. Being persecuted in any degree. Even today. That's the cross, right? So, what's up? Um, you know, when I think about the martyrdom, 
because I've contemplated this a lot. Uh, do you, and now knowing the character of God message, do you think that it is we will, some of us, be allowed to be martyrs because that is actually the only way our own soul could possibly be saved? And the reason I ask this is because if you look at, like, the Dark Ages, there were people who um, recanted at one point and then they, mm. you know, they, like, almost, like, unrecanted and then they were martyred or even, like, Peter denying Jesus and then ending up being martyred for him. It's like, it was basically like, if we're allowed to be martyrs at a certain time, it may be because God knows if he allows us to continue living, we would fall back mm. possibly into sin. Or is it we would be martyred after, like, our characters are already sealed and he knows we're not going to sin? You know, mm. about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. But I think your first point, I think I lean more towards that. Oh. Uh, yes, there will be some who uh, haven't had enough time to grow in Christ. There will be many converts in the end, and they won't have the time to get to know God as quickly as we have, but they will love Him with all their hearts. And I believe, yes, many of them will have to seal their testimony with their lives. So, again, Satan's army wages war through deception and violently persecuting and killing others. Christ's army wages war with truth and by being violently persecuted. 2 Corinthians 4, 8-12 through 12 says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Amen. Just as Christ, just as God was manifested in the body of Christ 2,000 years ago, so will, Christ, so will God be manifested in the body of Christ in the end the body of Christ being the church. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Right? So what is this saying? This is saying that when we are suffering and being persecuted for Christ, that is a manifestation of Christ himself. And like Ben said, when Christ is lifted up, he will draw all men unto him. So, death worketh in us, or we live in the face of death, but this results in eternal life for those who witness it. There, I recently heard a story of uh, a monk named Telemachus. Have any of you heard of him? Telemachus. This is really interesting. He, hundreds of years ago, I forget exactly when, but it was in Rome, he was a monk at first, but he felt to close off from the world, right? He realized, oh, I'm supposed to be in the world, but not of it. And so he went to Rome to be a witness for Christ. And at one point, he somehow ended up witnessing a gladiator fight in a Colosseum. And it hurt his soul. And he tried to stop it. He went in and stopped it. And then... The audience stoned him. Wow. They, they killed him. Wow. Right? Um, that was the cross of Christ. And it's interesting, because of what he did there, Emperor Heronius actually ended up being convicted by that scene. And the emperor outlawed gladiator fights wow. from then on. Awesome. Yeah. It's, it's incredible. But that's just a small snippet of the power of the cross. That's what the cross does. When we suffer and we die, we, may, we won't see the fruit because we're going to be dead. But we can die in faith knowing that it will bear fruit and it will be like seed for the gospel. So again, oops. Yes. Again, the cross of Christ is the power of God for salvation because it reveals the heart of God and the sinfulness of Satan and man. That's what the cross does. So when we are blessed to be partakers of his sufferings, this is what we get to take part of in the great controversy, right? Vindicating the character of God before the world and helping everyone know the choice, right? We'll be able to say, here's life, choose life. Or if you don't, it's death, right? And again, we don't only have to use this information for a theoretical 
suffering in the future. This can be now. Right? When we are persecuted or people hammer us with their harsh words and criticisms, we can either respond in kind and be mean back to them, or we can respond like Christ with love. And it's, it's profound and overlooked that the training and the preparation for potentially something greater, like being on the world stage and potentially having to lay down your life or, or not resist evil and trust that God will fight for you. Uh, it's in the home, right? Like you said, mm. just in the home, like if you know, you're with your children or your spouse and you know, you're tempted to get a little bit of heat, heated. Mm. And it's just right there, like having that Christ-like character, you know, not retaliating, yeah. not returning railing with railing or accusation, not raising the voice. Mm. Those are little steps, but they're, they're huge. They're massive. He that is faithful with little will be faithful with much. Kurt. And we must ever remember that none of this is possible without the indwelling, the constant indwelling of the Spirit of God. Exactly. None of us will be able to stand through any of what's coming without Him. Mm. And sometimes I think we can get overwhelmed and frightened because we go into the mode of thinking, how am I going to do this? How am I going to mm. do this? I can't do this. You're right. You can't. Yep. But there is one who can. Oh, Amen. 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 We, we don't need to think about it and worry like, oh, God, how am I going to stand? How am I going to be a good martyr? Yeah. No. Yeah. Don't worry about that. As our days are, so shall our strength be. Amen. Take it a day at a time. Be faithful with the little that God is giving you and the little things where God is allowing you to be persecuted and where He's allowing you to suffer so that He can give you His gold, His faith, refined in the fire of these things. Oh, fire. <laughs> That's right. And so, I want to encourage you all, you know, when we suffer for the cause of Christ, don't ba fight back with f f against fire with fire. You know, don't get into big, crazy Facebook arguments, right? That's not the cross. When we fight back using the weapons of our enemies, the cross ceases to exist. There is no power of the gospel anymore. It's gone. Right? And... I highly re recommend Danny Brown. He put together a compilation of Aiden Below's book. It's called Resist Not Evil. And it's just a compilation of practical stories of people just in everyday life. Real, real Yes, real, true historical stories. And they're really short. Like some are just a few paragraphs. Like a little paragraph. Short, easy. Uh, of people being mean to others, right? Someone coming at you with heated words or arguments and the other person not responding with evil, right? But letting it happen. And then it shows how that changed the other's life, right? In the Adventist church, uh, or in the early years, Adventist ministers loved to debate ministers from other churches. Mm -hmm. They had this, this spirit of debate. And, and I've, I've read, I don't know if any of you read here and hereafter by Uriah but he talks about some of these it's about it's it's a basically any objection to any any verse anybody could bring up uh, mm. about the state of the dead yeah he's got an answer to it and they, yeah. you know, and but you read it and he uses these barbs and and you know you're an idiot if you believe i mean this, this is the impression that you get and this is why ellen white warned our ministers to stay away from that spirit of debate they would they would win the debate mm. but lose the Soul. They, would, yeah. they would make these enemies and you would try to embarrass people or make them look stupid in front of their congregations. Mm. This, is, we, this is why we need to avoid, like you said, these types of Facebook conversations where it, it really gets... I, I, I've seen it so many times and it just hurts my heart mm. and, you know, when people that believe many of the truths that we do are using Satan's methods yep. to try to convince other people of the truth. Exactly. Exactly. It's... Yeah, I don't have the Facebook app on my phone anymore. It's, <laughs> it just fires me up seeing these things, and I, I know I, I don't need those temptations. But uh, yeah, so I just want to encourage all of us, instead of responding to violence with violence, anger with anger, uh, rudeness with rudeness, let's respond like Christ in love. 
And like Kirk said, we can only do that through Christ living in us by resisting the devil and submitting to God. That is the key, submitting and trusting in God to have our back and to take care of us. When we hear him speak to our minds, this is the way, walk ye in it. Don't resist, just submit. That's the key. So, does anyone have any questions about any of that? And I, I believe we have this solemn duty, knowing these truths, that we are to, you know, really to win our brothers and sisters, especially those who are, who are brothers and sisters, believing in Jesus Christ throughout Adventism and all other denominations, that we have to show them the love, the character of God, and then they'll be willing to hear us out because yeah. nobody wants to hear out somebody who feels like they're uh, judging or uh, condemning them. You know, we have to show them the love of the character of God and then they'll be interested, you know, to know the source of our love. Exactly. Amen, brother. Yeah, so that's the key. Character over controversy. All right. And so with that being said, let's have a prayer and... Uh, it's a character over controversy, and it's a controversy over the character of God. Nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for blessing us with so much wonderful truth and insight, O oh God. But like we said earlier, we want the truth to sanctify us. We don't want to respond to people in hateful or rude manners, God. So we ask that you will cleanse our hearts of all the lies about you and your character and cleanse us of all uh, backbiting and spirit of debate and all of these things, God. We, we just want to be like you. We want to be like Christ. And Lord, when we suffer for your kingdom, please help us to remember the power of the cross and how the power to conquer is not through violence and deceit and manipulation, but through allowing ourselves to be the victims of that, God. Please open our eyes to these unseen realities and please keep the cross ever before us in a practical way. Uh, We thank you so much for sending your Son in the flesh and sending your Spirit into our flesh, Father. We ask that you'll fill us with your Spirit and guide us in all of our ways and everything we think, say, and do, O God. Please help us to love like you and to see people through your eyes, God. Thank you so much for hearing us and for being with us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Sean. Great job, bro.